Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the adaptive immune response and immunosuppressants. So we're trying to understand how the drug rapamycin or sirolimus works, and it works by stopping signal free from causing differentiation of the naive uh, T cell and then proliferation of the naive T cell. So it stops this final step of activation of the naive T cell. Okay, so we have looked at the uh, PI3 kinase AKT mTOR uh, pathway, and we're just at the end of this pathway now, uh, looking at how an activated AKT, or protein kinase B, is going to activate this mTOR1, which will then cause the differentiation and proliferation. Okay, so one of the things that AKT does is that it phosphorylates PRAS40. So AKT is a serine threonine kinase, uh, which phosphorylates serine and threonine residues in proteins. So one of the things it can do is add a phosphate group onto PRAS40 here, and that causes PRAS40 to dissociate from uh, the regulatory associated protein of mTOR, RAPTOR over here. And uh, that's one of the things that is going to help um, activate the mTOR1. And it is needed for the activation, but it's only a minor component of it, okay? So this isn't what actually activates mTOR1 majorly. There's another pathway that's uh, m majorly important in activating the mTOR1. So one thing that it does is fast phosphorylates PRAS40, and that therefore drops off the uh, mTOR1. Next, what it's going to do is um, lead to uh, the um, activation of something known as the REB GTP protein. Okay, so let me explain how it's going to do this. So, AKT is going to phosphorylate a protein known as the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2, known as TSC2. So this stands for, um, let me put it over here, this stands for the tuberous and then that's the T, then sclerosis is the S, and then complex is the C, and then it's the protein 2. Okay, so it's the second component of the tuberous sclerosis complex, which is something we'll see in a moment. Okay, so I won't colour it in, in pink, because uh, I want to colour the phosphate group in pink that's going to be added on to the tuberous sclerosis complex, protein 2. So AKT is going to phosphorylate the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2. And what happens when it's phosphorylated is that it can now bind to another protein. Okay, so here comes this other protein that's now going to bind to the tuberous sclerosis complex 2. Whoops. Uh, and this new protein that is going to bind to the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 is known as 1433, which is a very catchy name, okay, um, and this is going to inhibit this tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2, basically. And what do I mean inhibit it? Well, usually what happens is the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 wants to bind with another protein known as the tuberous sclerosis complex 1. So let me show you what would normally happen. Normally, tuberous sclerosis complex 2, TSC2 here, would bind to another protein known as the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 1, TSC1. Okay, and they would make what is naturally called the, tu the tuberous sclerosis complex. Okay, and what does this tuberous sclerosis complex do? Well, usually it um, deactivates a um, G protein, okay? So the normal action of this tuberous sclerosis complex is the deactivation of a G protein, known as the REB G protein. Okay, so REB is a monomeric G protein, okay? So here is the REB protein, and when it's in the on state, it has guanosine triphosphate bound to it, GTP here, and when it's in the off state, it has guanosine diphosphate bound to it. So that's uh, true for all uh, G proteins. And whoops, I've put a B there. Reb. Okay, so when you have a G protein with GTP bound, it's in the on state. And when you have a G protein with GDP bound, it's in the off state. Now, the tuberous sclerosis complex 
cuts that final phosphate group off the GTP and converts it therefore into GTP, sorry, GDP, and thereby inactivates the Reb GTP to Reb GDP. So that's what the tuberous sclerosis complex usually does. However, once AKT has been activated by uh, interleukin 2 binding to the interleukin 2 receptor, it phosphorylates the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2. That then binds to this protein 1433, and then the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2 can no longer bind to the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 1. So, you no longer get the formation of the tuberous sclerosis complex here. Okay, and they're partners in crime, basically, the tuberous sclerosis complex 1 protein and the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein. And basically, without tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2, the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 1 doesn't function. So, you stop converting the Reb GTP to Reb GDP. This leads to a buildup of Reb GTP in the cytoplasm of the cell, and this then goes and activates the mTORC1 through mechanisms that are not understood, okay? Uh, and then the uh, mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1 then goes and um, will cause differentiation and proliferation of the T-cell, okay? So that leads to the final activation of the T-cell. The drug, rapamycin or sirolimus, is going to come in and it's going to bind to the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1, and it stops it from becoming active, even if AKT becomes active and tries to activate the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Uh, if the rapamycin drug is bound, it will not succeed. The mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1 will not activate. Therefore, you will not get uh, differentiation of your uh, T cell uh, into um, it, into its uh, mature T cell form, okay, and you will not then get proliferation. So, therefore, you will completely block T cell activation, and uh, thereby you stop all three of those branches of the immune system that we looked at, uh, because uh, all of them require the activation of T cells at some point. So the humoral immune system requires the activation of naive CD4 positive T cells to T helper naught cells, uh, which can then uh, proliferate and produce a whole population of T helper naught cells, which can then differentiate into T helper 2 cells, which are essential for B cell activation. In the uh, cell mediated phagosomal pathway, uh, we needed CD4 positive naive T cells to differentiate into T helper naught cells, proliferate into a population of T helper naught cells, and then uh, differentiate into T helper 1 cells, which produced interferon gamma, which helped the macrophages to destroy the phagosomal pathogen. In the um, cell mediated response where the pathogen was intracellular, uh, well, was it, it cytoplasmic, was within the cytoplasm, we needed C naive CD8 positive uh, T cells uh, to differentiate into cytotoxic T cells and then proliferate into a population of cytotoxic T cells which go forth and cause apoptosis of infected cells. These processes are all going to be cut off if you've given uh, rapamycin to the naive uh, T lymphocytes, basically, uh, because they just cannot uh, differentiate and then proliferate. So you'll cut off the immune system. Okay, so that's the mechanism of action of the drug rapamycin, also known as sirolimus. In the next video, what we'll turn our attention to is the mechanism of action of the drug alemtuzumab, uh, which is this scary one that works by killing all of the T and B cells in your body.